Well, you know, we shot film, and unless it was a hugely important story that had to be on soon, and there was no soon, because film had to be processed, developed, edited, uh, some stories went to Japan and were fed by satellite. Those were the important stories. My stuff, which was, aside from the, the Da Nang and uh, demonstrations, they went to San Francisco for fast, quote, fast uh, airing. Otherwise, the stuff went to New York and they edited it for my afternoon news show, but it was really hard. When you were out in the field in Vietnam, let's say I was, for example, in Pleiku, which is nowhere near Cambodia, 15 miles from the border. You shot stories, you uh, wrote the script, you narrated the script, the film went in a big yellow bag, it was put on a plane and sent to Saigon, to the bureau and these big film bags, they were used to, all the, the, the uh, pilots were used to that. And there were, we had regular people at the airport, Tansanut in Saigon, that picked up the film bags. And then they went to the bureau and then this whole process began. It was very cumbersome. The only thing that was quick was radio because there was a booth in Saigon, well, if you had to be, of course, you had to be there, where you could go and feed a radio story, or if you had to update a script, you could do it that way. But otherwise, it took forever. I worked with two Vietnamese, Tung and Min. Uh, we had Japanese film crews. We had American crews that rotated in and out. Uh, but I had Tung and Min, two very nice Vietnamese who, if they were shocked to work with a woman, didn't show it. They were educated, they spoke beautiful French and some English. I studied French in high school and spoke, hmm, it was usable. So between my broken French and their broken English, <laughs> we managed to work together. And actually it was useful because when we would be out on a story and there would be demonstrations and these huge banners written in Vietnamese, you know, if you were with an American crew, nobody knew what they said, but these guys would tell me. So I was able to use that information. What was the state of the war at the time that you were there? It was, it was hot and heavy. Uh, by the time the war was over, we had 500,000 troops there. When I was there, it was 300,000. That's a lot of people. And so it was, it was really heating up then. Did you ever feel fear for your life? Oh, yeah, several times. Are you kidding? You know, you, you got around by plane. You, you, you went in a big C-130, and then whenever you landed, you had to get to wherever you were going, either in a Jeep, going pat on the roads with high reeds on the side, with it could be people with rifles back there, and the, frequently there were, uh, or you rode in open-sided Huey helicopters with just a seat belt, flying 2,000 feet up, sitting next to somebody heavily armed, you know, looking at the treetops, uh, you know, it's, a, let's say, of concern. I had um, uh, jeans, I, I, khaki color jeans and pants. You know, nobody, when I went, nobody told me anything. Uh, somebody, somebody who had been there said, take some men's handkerchiefs. I said, what for? They said, well, when you get tear gassed in Saigon, you cover your face with them. Hello, that was my advice. And then a lot of jokes, keep your head down. They did give you your shots. I had a lot of shots for every disease you can possibly imagine, including plague. And it's a good thing because I was in a provincial hospital where they had plague, bubonic plague. Uh, but that was okay. I didn't get sick there. Uh, I wore boots or I took um, uh, sneakers when you didn't need boots all the time. Uh, but, you know, I sort of improvised. Were people just surprised to see you in, in areas there? Uh, yeah, I guess the troops were surprised and very happy. I got nothing but great treatment. They were so happy to see an American woman that, you know, and I said it had ABC on my lapel. Uh, you had access, no problem. The military limited nothing. You could go anywhere you wanted. You could fly in any of their planes you wanted to. There was no censorship. There was no restriction of any kind. You wanted to go into a dangerous area, 
Yeah, hey, sure, you want to go out with them? Hey, go ahead. They were more than happy to let you go wherever you wanted. What was your opinion overall about the coverage, U.S. coverage of the, of the war? Well, it was um, bang, bang, shoot them up. That's why my stuff didn't get on the evening news very often. They, did, they wanted combat. And I think that's because the men were running it and they all have too much testosterone and they love that stuff. Um, but this, the, the coverage was, uh, I thought the stuff they did in Vietnam was good. I thought the coverage of the demonstrations, the anti-war demonstrations, varied. It depended on the correspondent being careful that the stuff of the demonstrations were shot fairly, that it wasn't all weird hippie types, that you had the woman with the baby carriage and the, the middle class couple, and that you didn't misrepresent the demonstrations because they did involve a lot of ordinary people. And we had a split. The correspondents, college educated, mostly anti-war. The film crews at that time are not a, the same crews that we you see today. They are not film school guys. These are, most of them were uh, from former stagehands or they came out of a, a blue collar background and they tended to be pro-war. So we had a lot of discussions. That's U.S. side. Uh, and also the film editors. You had to watch your editing. If you covered a demonstration, you wanted to be there when it was edited, there again, so you'd have a fair presentation of what was uh, shown. But it depended on the correspondence, how, how much you, you rode herd on these issues.